Trade talks between the U.S. and China appear to have stalled after talks between both sides broke off last week. It comes as the U.S. raised tariffs on $200 billion of Chinese imports and China retaliated by imposing tariffs on $60 billion worth of U.S. goods. As the trade war between the U.S. and China intensifies, experts say that President Trump's admiration of tariffs began in Japan's 80s boom. It is also one of his longest and most deeply held policy positions. The president has been consistent on trade for decades, unlike on other issues. Jennifer Miller joins me now from Hanover, New Hampshire. She's an assistant professor of history at Dartmouth College and wrote a paper last year examining the president's relationship with Japanese businesses in the 1980s. Jennifer, thank you so much for being with us. You mentioned- Thanks so much for having me. You mentioned in the New York Times article, quote, tariffs tie so much of Trump together. What did you mean by that? What I meant by that is that tariffs represent a lot of what Trump wants to believe about himself and what he claims he's going to accomplish for the American people. So tariffs are something that he can enact unilaterally. And one thing he has talked about is how we shouldn't be beholden to allies. America should act for itself. America should act to defend itself. And so that's something that tariffs allow him to do. It allows him to use executive power, which is something he speaks very strongly about. In his uh, speech at the Republican National Convention, he talked about how I alone can fix it. Tariffs also prevent certain things from entering the United States, but not others. So tariffs are on goods, they're on products, but they're not on things like foreign money. And Trump himself has long relied on foreign money in his real estate career. Many politicians welcome foreign investment in their states or in their cities. And so tariffs are helpful in that respect. They make the border fixed in certain ways, but not in others. And I think that's something Trump wants to accomplish. Well, specifically, Jennifer, what were some of the flashpoints in Donald Trump's career that shaped his views around trade imbalance and tariffs? So I think Trump's first flirtation with the presidency in 1987 and 1988 is a really key moment here, because as he was talking about how he might run, he even went to New Hampshire to give a speech about this. He started talking about some of his thoughts about foreign affairs. And in 1987 and 1988, it seemed like one of the biggest threats to the United States was Japan. The trade deficit between the United States and Japan had continued to grow over the decade. The United States had done all sorts of things. It had applied some tariffs. It had asked Japan to restructure its domestic economy. It had changed the value of currency. And nothing seemed to be changing this trade deficit. So that had a big impact on many Americans in the 1980s, and Trump was no different. So as he started to talk about what he would be like if he became president, he talked about how he would be the strong leader that America needed. He would stand strong against these freeloading allies like Japan. He would tax them and he would invest it at home. So are we facing a repeat of this history now, except with China instead of Japan? I think we are in some ways in that we seem to have a huge trade deficit with a country that America, that the United States doesn't really know how to address. On the other hand, I think some things are different as well. Um, to give a few examples, the United States didn't see Japan as a military threat. And I think the nature of the U.S. rivalry with China is a little different because it also has a military or defensive component. In the 80s, the United States was also more willing to work with its allies to try to address some of these issues. So they did, sometimes they did multilateral agreements about revaluing things like currency to try to bring down this trade deficit. Trump does not want to follow that path. One of the first things he did was pull out of the Trans-Pacific Partnership. So I think there's some similarities in terms of how Trump sees tariffs as a key tool to try to address this, but there's also some big differences. Well, are there advisors in the president's administration who have reinforced the president's views on trade? So I think one of the advisors who has is a guy named Robert Lighthizer, who is the U.S. trade representative, and he had been the deputy trade representative in the 1980s. And one thing he had done in this time period is he had negotiated things like voluntary export restraints with countries like Japan on things like steel 
And what this was essentially was rather than putting a tariff on Japan, Japan would agree to only export a certain amount of this product. These weren't limited to Japan, but Japan was one of the most prominent. So you do see some direct connections in terms of the personnel who are helping him shape this policy. And what do you make of what some would call a contradiction here throughout the president's career, benefiting from foreign investments, but also finding that it's very easy to rail against them when he loses? I think this is Trump's idea of globalization on some level. So on one level, Trump ran on the idea that globalization was a huge threat. Globalization in the form of immigrants, globalization in the form of products, globalization in the form of manufacturing, moving overseas. He said all of that is an enormous threat. It's left America in carnage, as he famously said in his inaugural. But on the other hand, Trump has always been deeply embedded in global finance. He sought out Japanese investment in the 1980s in his various properties. He was well aware of the amount of Japanese finance in the United States. He actually bought the Plaza Hotel from a conglomerate of Japanese investors. And when he himself started, his career started to enter sort of a financial freefall in the early 90s, he sought out more Japanese investment. He sought to sell his super yacht to the Japanese, for example. So I think this isn't so much a contradiction in that it's always been there. It just has to do with what Trump conceives of as threatening and what he doesn't. And he sees tangible things like goods and immigrants as threatening, but finance to him is not, perhaps because of the extent to which it enabled his own career. All right, Jennifer Miller. Jennifer, thanks very much for your perspective. Appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me.